it's happy Christmas for Boris Johnson. He's got a majority of 80 and the Labour and Liberal Democrats are shattered. The SNP have more seats but less influence. So is it all Christmas crackers for Boris or are there ghosts in the Christmases yet to come? Join our prestigious panel of political pundits who will tell us the answer on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show as we examine the fallout from the UK's Christmas election. Today we return to our prestigious panel of political pundits to assess the consequences of the Johnson triumph. Has Boris bagged the vote but lost the United Kingdom? Can Labour survive the election post-mortem? And whatever happened to the likely Liberal Democrats? In the blue corner we have Peter Oborn, the man who knows a great deal more about the Tory party than most Tories. In the election, Peter became that rarest of political animals, a traditional Tory who voted for Jeremy Corbyn. As for voting for Mr Corbyn, I felt it was the economically sensible thing to do. I felt it was, was much more likely to be economic security with Mr Corbyn's plan of a, um, of a final say referendum after and a, and a choice between a soft Brexit and, and staying in than Mr Johnson's plan of basically res risking everything on a hard Brexit. In the yellow corner, we feature Lembit Opik, one-time Liberal Democrat presidential candidate, but now a rebel born-again Brexiteer. Lembit emerged as the clear winner among our forecasters by not only predicting the election result, which many people did, but the defeat of Joe Swinson, which virtually nobody else did. But one to watch is Joe Swinson's own seat. She needs to remember what happened to Nick Clegg in Sheffield Hallam when he was leader and he lost. And in the red corner, a newcomer to our panel in Chris Williamson, rebel former Labour MP who stood against his old party as an independent and suffered the same fate as most other independents in this election. However, Chris has some clear advice for his old colleagues on how to avoid imminent self-destruction. I think, as I say, whoever comes forward as a leader needs to, as I've already said, accept Brexit, a progressive Brexit, a people's Brexit, make that argument, repudiate this whole nonsense of the, of the witch hunt and, and enthuse the members, bring the party together. Before the new MPs have managed to get their feet under their desks, indeed, before they've even had desks, they've been put to work by their new taskmasters. Returning MPs come back to a very different place. The building is the same, but inside it has changed and changed utterly. Instead of a truculent minority parliament, we have a step for assembly with a huge majority of 80 uber loyalist MPs. Boris Johnson is master of all that he surveys. No longer will little known MPs be asked with breathless excitement by the media how they are shaping up for the next knife edge vote. There won't be any such votes. Household names like Anna Subri and Dominic Grieve will disappear from our TV screens, perhaps forever. But is it all plain sailing for the prime minister? Sometimes in politics, nothing fails like success. Alex asks our panel how events are likely to unfold. And now I'm joined to read the ruins of the general election by our prestigious panel of political pundits. But I'm now calling them the, the three rebel musketeers because we have Peter Auburn, a, a rebel Tory who ended up voting for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Chris Williamson, a rebel Labour MP who ended up voting for himself. Uh, and Lembert Opec, uh, a, a rebel Liberal who's the greatest Brexiteer in the, the ranks of the Liberal Democrats. And it's to you we turn first, Lembert, because you have won the prize uh, as the greatest forecaster of our political panel. Let's have a look at you uh, telling us what was going to happen in the election. I stick by my original... Uh, guesstimate that the Conservatives will get an overall majority with Boris Johnson. I'll even put a figure on that. I'm guessing a majority of 40. 
Now, at the time you uttered these, uh, these famous words, I, I think uh, Joe Swinson was uh, five to one against to, to lose her seat. So the, the first question is, did you get money on the demise of the Liberal Democrat leader? I didn't put anything on it. I think that would have jinxed my predictions. But I had one very good reason to think she'd lose. I did the same thing. And I could sense the same thing was happening to her as happened to me in my seat in 2010. But nobody listened, uh, including the Liberal Democrats, despite my repeated warnings that I thought she'd lose by a small margin. But as you say, I was right. And was Joe Swinson, in your opinion, does she epitomise the Liberal Democrat problems or, or were there deeper difficulties for the Liberals in this campaign? She was half the problem. Uh, I said here in this very studio that she wasn't cutting it in the general election. She just didn't come across as credible. And it seems that every time she appeared on television, her support went down. So that was half the problem. And the other half, and she's got to take responsibility for this too, is a ridiculous narrative. They were saying that they wouldn't have a second referendum despite having called for one for three years, they were simply going to scrap Brexit if they became the government. That would be like me going to my old seat of Montgomery and saying, we don't need to have another by-election to give people a chance to re-elect me. I'll just carry on being the MP anyway. It's not very democratic, is it? But Peter Robin, you achieved something fairly dramatic in this election. I mean, as the, the rest of the country, at least the rest of England, was running towards Boris Johnson, mm -hmm. you were busy running towards Jeremy Corbyn. What happened? Well, I, I would do the same again. I feel very uh, proud of what I did. Said, did. I mean, I exposed all the, the one lie after another after another by Johnson. And one of the things about the next 12 months is we're going to see uh, whether how he deals with having lied to the British public about Brexit, above all, but also everything else. Um, and uh, as for voting for Mr Corbyn, I thought it was the economically sensible thing to do. I felt it was, it was much more likely to be economic security with Mr Corbyn's plan of a final say referendum after and a, and a choice between a soft Brexit and staying in than Mr Johnson's plan of basically res risking everything on a hard Brexit, which he still seems to be encouraging that notion. But the, the, the great English public looked at Boris Johnson and said, this guy's OK, we're going to trust him with our votes. They did, and I... Um, it was a phenomenal result. It was the most important British general election, I'd say, certainly since 1945, maybe more important even than 1945, because I think it's going to change the nature of the country we are. It's an enormous experiment. And actually, I hope it works, because if it doesn't, the consequences will be very severe for all kinds of people who don't deserve to face those consequences. But it is an immense a moment in our national history. Now, Chris Williamson, you ended up standing as an independent in your own seat against the, the Labour Party to which you devoted most of your life. But I, I'm really interested. You, you actually found out you'd won comprehensively a court victory against the Labour Party during the election campaign and you kept it quiet so as not to embarrass your old party. Now, that tends to indicate to me there's something of a a deep underlying loyalty despite, uh, despite recent events. Why are we still trying to protect the Labour Party? Well, look, I've given 44 years of my life to the Labour Party. I believe that the Labour Party has been the best vehicle to deliver progressive social change in the country. And uh, when Jeremy Corbyn was elected as the leader, I felt that we had a genuine opportunity to, to bring about a modest socialist programme in the country and to, for the first time probably ever, to deliver ge a genuine ethical foreign policy. So I think what our position should have been, and something I would have been arguing for, was to say, yes, we accept the outcome of the referendum, and we sh our position should have been, it seems to me, in the, in the election should have been, in, in, to say, we will deliver a people's Brexit. That should have been the argument, not whether we're going to have another referendum and so on. But, the, of course, the other area that we made a huge error of judgment was in buying into this whole narrative that the Labour Party is a bigoted party, a racist party, an anti-Semitic party. And I think uh, Jeremy would have been far better to, at the very outset, to defend his own reputation. There's nobody in the House of Commons got a better record on, on standing up to bigotry and racism than Jeremy Corbyn. He should have defended his own reputation, the Labour Party's reputation as, as an anti-racist party. And I feel that we should have defended, as I did, numerous people that were thrown under the bus, people like Ken Livingston and many Jewish members of the Labour Party who have been specifically targeted, left-wing Jews have been targeted for suspension and expulsion from the Labour Party. It's, it's many absolutely people would say, would they not, that that itself was a failure in leadership, not able to 
establish the Labour Party's reputation beyond peradventure as an anti-racist party. But I'm interested in what you say about Brexit. Uh, is that, in your analysis, the difference between 2017, where Jeremy Corbyn, as Labour leader, on a fairly ambitious manifesto, made up vast ground during the election campaign, and 2019, where Jeremy Corbyn, on a, an ambitious Labour manifesto, made up hardly any ground at all. Is Brexit the key difference in your Oh, opinion? yes, absolutely. I'm convinced of that. We should have been um, uh, taking the position, a stronger position, than we took in 2017. And look, in the end, you know, whether we're in the European Union, whether we leave with or without a deal, it's kind of irrelevant. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world. We have our own sovereign currency. We have our own central bank. We could therefore invest in a big fiscal stimulus to deal with any economic shock of leaving the European Union. And we could have been saying, we're going to have a people's Brexit. We're going to invest in the economy. We're going to invest in manufacturing. We're going to invest in public services, renewable energy, renewing the infrastructure. We could have appealed to people and given people hope. Uh, something that's been really puzzling me. Uh, it's something actually you said in a previous programme. You were isolating the fact that Dominic Cummings was trailing Johnston's coat to provoke an election. Mm. I wonder, why on earth did the opposition parties fall into it? Why did they deliver Boris Johnson the greatest Christmas present he'll ever have in his life? Uh, a majority of 80 and a commanding position in the Westminster yeah. Park. Have you an explanation, Peter? It's, I, well, it's one of the points I... Mr. Tony Blair was really right about. He said to have an, an, an election before Brexit is sorted is an act of madness, and he was, it was obviously the case. I, I do think this is... Jo Swinson started this. She... Uh, uh, probably the worst leader of any well-known party there's ever been, I think. And I, 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 she was very poor. That was, and she took a very narrow perspective, which was what's best for li the Liberal Democrats, not if, given that her, she claimed that her great thing was Europe, not but what's best on, to, to, to keep Britain in the European Union. Um, and so she was, it was a disgraceful decision by her. And then Corbyn fell into the trap. And that's what led to it. And it was Liberal Democrat self-interest. And she paid a heavy price for that. This act. wasn't just Joe Swinson, was it, uh, Lambert Opet? The whole Liberal Democrats were gung-ho for... Uh, an election. What on earth were they thinking of? Complete idiotic delusion by the Liberal Democrats. I know exactly why they did it, because I was speaking to them. They thought they could sweep up 48% of the vote, the 48% who voted Remain, and they thought that they would have a massive lift. Jo Swenson and her team may not have thought she was actually going to be Prime Minister, but they were seriously thinking they were going to get 100-plus seats. And I think, therefore, that they were architects of their own doom, actually losing a seat, going down to 11 seats uh, rather than gaining. But Chris Williamson, you, you were there as a Member of Parliament. W w were there no voices behind the Speaker's chair saying after Johnson was totally humiliated in the Supreme Court after he came back from America, blustering, even swearing under his breath at a Prime Minister's question. Did nobody sort of say, let's keep this guy hanging, let's get in the Speaker, let's find a compromise candidate? Was there no voices saying... There were a few, there were a few, but few and far between, regrettably. I remember being on your show, actually, Alec, uh, Alex, a few months ago, when we were asking the question, will there, will there be an election before Christmas? I was absolutely confident there wouldn't be. It made no sense at all. I mean, only for Boris Johnson, not for any other political party. I was, well, having said that, of course, the SNP did very well. well but but even well, the SNP certainly gained seats, mm. but have lost influence. They, well, that's gone very from true. Very, very true. Absolutely, seats yeah. in a minority exactly, parliament yeah. uh, to a, you know, a huge victory mm. Of, mm. of 47 or perhaps 48 mm. seats, depending on how you mm. count no, them, indeed. in a parliament where Johnson reigns supreme. But, but on this very show, we were predicting something like this would happen. Boris Johnson has played political chess par excellence. Mm. The opposition parties have been in check continuously. Yeah. Boris played a great game. Once that, once that die had been cast, then it was inevitable what the outcome was going to be, and that's why I made my predictions. Well, we've ended this half of the show on the Lambert Open out forecasting Sir John <laughs> Curtis, if that indeed were possible. Join us after the break when we'll start looking not at what has happened, but the Christmas is yet to come. Welcome back. Now, I'm going to ask our prestigious panel of political pundits to, to get their uh, forecasting boots on and tell us what now is going to happen in politics, given the election result. Peter Oborn, Boris Johnson, master of all these surveys. What happens now? 
He's master of all he surveys for quite a short period of time, potentially. I, I, the big issue is, is the, the, the lever prospectus for Brexit going to lead to prosperity and national independence and so forth. We'll, and that will take a little while to work itself out. If it doesn't work, I can see um, a real disaster for the Conservatives because they will be blamed for having cr forced this outcome and then they will be blamed for having lied about it uh, and cheated their way to an election victory which was a fraud on the voters. If, it, if their prospectus works, then he, they will be hailed as conquering heroes. It will be the last we ever hear of the Labour Party and it will be the last we ever hear when the, uh, of the Lib Dems. Uh, and it will, he will have created a new political epoch. Alternatively, in five years' time, we could be seeing a smashed to a Conservative Party, a demoralised party, and something like... Uh, all the, I've noticed all the commentators noting that Corbyn is finished. Well, I can see the, the Tories have led Britain out of the European Union and it's been an economic and social fiasco with millions of lives ruined by it. I can see this is the one... And I was saying this to my Tory friends all along. The one way you want a far-left government, which Mr Williamson might feel happy in, is by going for a hard Brexit. Because if you create economic chaos, the left can, see, can make, really use that. And so if it doesn't work, uh, uh, th then I think the whole political landscape could be very different in a few years' time than it is now, and it will be much more favourable to the left. Now Chris Williams, this must be music to your ears. I mean, uh, most of the analysts are now talking about back to 1983, where, where uh, Michael Foote was so badly beaten on a, a socialist manifesto. But, but uh, what Peter Roburn seems to be saying, the, the Tories might muck it up for you and uh, allow the Labour Party a route back. Well, they might very well do. I mean, and this was the worst election result for the Labour Party, I think, since 1935. But remember, ten years after that, we had the most reforming uh, Labour government in, in history. There was a war in the middle. There was indeed. Uh, and it will depend on whether or not, you know, the Tories do make a complete mess of it and, and create a real, a real crisis in the country. But, of course, the other thing is, if the Labour Party is going to benefit from that, I think a lot will depend on who they choose as their leader. We have now a membership which is overwhelmingly, you know, if you like, left of centre, progressive socialist outlook uh, in that sense. Um, so I think the next leader has to absolutely buy into the whole uh, Brexit narrative. I think they also have to repudiate this absurd uh, witch hunt which the Labour Party has subjected itself to. Because if we are going to be in a, in, in a position, if the Labour Party is going to be in a position to, to, to take advantage, it needs a mobilised, uh, enthused, inspired grassroots membership to doesn't, take the, the battle to, to the wider general public. Doesn't it also need uh, a leader with credibility? Uh, the, the Jeremy Corbyn, who... And not as well as you have, but I've known for you know, 30 years and more, never really convinced as a political leader. Other people available within the, the Parliamentary Labour Party who can provide that certain yeah, gravitas. I'm not, so sure, I'm not so sure about that. But I think the evidence doesn't really bear that out when you consider the fact that in 2017, Labour achieved the biggest increase in vote share since 1945. And they also remember, even in this election, Jeremy achieved uh, more votes than Tony Blair did in his last successful election in 2005. I think, as I say, whoever comes forward as a leader needs to, as I've already said, accept Brexit, a progressive Brexit, a people's Brexit, make that argument, repudiate this whole nonsense of the, of the witch hunt and, and enthuse the members, bring the party together. And uh, frankly, Boris Johnson actually gave a masterclass class in how to be a strong leader because he dealt with his malcontents by removing the whip from them. And I said to Jeremy, the biggest battle for the Labour Party, the most important battle for the Labour Party, was to win the civil war inside the Labour Party. And the malcontents are very small in number. He had the overwhelming majority, and I think if he'd have done that, we could have made a lot more progress. Lambert Opic, for a leadership contest in the Liberal Democrats, there's not going to be too large a field, is there? Absolutely right. Uh, there's no point in getting rid of malcontents in the Lib Dems because, first of all, there's no leader to get rid of them. And secondly, if you got rid of the malcontents, there'd be no one left. So, basically, they've got a huge problem. Uh, the fact that Jo Swinson lost her position could be good in the long run. She wasn't going anywhere. She's a nice person, good constituency MP she was, but she was no leader. So that's probably a good thing uh, that she lost her seat. 
There was no quick way back for the Lib Dems. They're decimated around the country. So uh, I think I know who should be the leader, and that person then needs to be inspirational, a bit like Charles Kennedy, really, the kind of person that the general public who aren't that liberal, aren't that democratic, will think, well, this person's all right. The name I'm thinking of, Leila Moran. I was going to ask you anyway, because if you're forecasting, <laughs> there'll be you know, punters around the country will be anxious to get their, their money on as quickly as possible. Well, I, I can give you there are other, uh, I should say, other Liberal Democrat leaders are available, but perhaps not too many of them. <laughs> if I can turn this now to, to whatever flies we can find in, in Boris Johnson's ointment. Uh, we can't have, have him had an unalloyed uh, happy Christmas. We, we must think of ghosts that might haunt him in the new year. Now, Delivering a successful Brexit is his key challenge. But how about the Celtic French? How about Scotland and how about Northern Ireland? Uh, are there movements there that, that, that might keep uh, our Prime Minister awake at night? Well, absolutely. And one of the many lies which Mr Johnson repeatedly came up with during the campaign was no border issues in trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. And he just said there will be no customs checks, nothing. And he kept on saying, and of course there are going to be. And that it, and it caused all kinds of issues at the, not at the land border, but at the, the sea border. And I, and I can see it causing resentment and disaffection and a move towards the United Ireland as well. And I, and I feel that that will be, I think he might have real trouble. And do you see Chris Williamson in the, let's do Northern Ireland first, in the Northern Irish results. Do you see indications that perhaps the, uh, the ice is breaking in terms of the political formulation in Northern Ireland? Is there a, are we closer to a united Ireland than at any point? I, I think partition? so. And I think, I think the election of the Tories, the election of Boris Johnson, does bring that a lot closer. Frankly, I think probably now there's, uh, there's a majority in Northern Ireland. And uh, we saw in the election results of the DUP losing ground and the SDLP gaining ground in, in Northern Ireland. It seems that, the, you know, the, there is a move now uh, in that direction. So I think we're closer now to the breakup of the United Kingdom than we've ever been. I think independence in Scotland is now a step closer. Uh, United Ireland, which is something I strongly support, is a step closer too. I think that is something that could very well keep Boris Johnson awake at night, yeah, over the next few years. And you were a shadow set to stay for, for, for Northern Ireland mm. uh, at one time, but during the peace uh, uh, negotiations and process. What, what's your analysis of the Northern Ireland results? It's not the problem. Uh, the Nationalists, for the first time ever, had more seats than the Unionists. But when you look at the actual vote, the Unionist vote was far in excess of the Nationalist or the Republican side. Uh, and in that sense, I don't think that Northern Ireland is unstable. It's gone a little bit closer towards United Ireland, but that's not going to happen for at least 10 years, which is at least two general elections. Great. So let's climax our programme with just a brief indication from you all on my favourite subject, whether Scotland. You first, Lambert. Boris Johnson cannot afford to lose Scotland. If he has a, allows a referendum, and if the referendum goes in favour of independence, that will cost him his credibility. That will be his legacy, much more than Brexit. Uh, so the big question is, number one, does he allow a referendum? Uh, and he'll only do that if he thinks he can win it. Or number two, does he take the heat by not allowing a referendum, by saying, well, it was meant to be a once-in-a-generation thing? My guess is that he'll resist the referendum. And if he can sort Scotland out, I'll go as far as saying he can win the next general election because he'll have kept the union together, he'll, he will deliver Brexit. I don't agree with Peter on that. And as far as the skeletons in his closet are concerned, there are so many of them, they don't fit in the closet. So he's not in any danger uh, at his personal level either. Chris uh, Williamson, eh, can he, he deal with Scotland, Boris Johnson? I'm not sure he can. I think he will absolutely resist the referendum, though, because I think he fears that he will lose it. However, what the government in Scotland might do is just organise their own referendum and have a Catalonia situation. I can't see Boris Johnson sending in the, you know, the troops and the police in the way in which we saw in Spain. So I do believe that the likelihood of, uh, of independence for Scotland is, is a significant step closer now, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Peter? I mean, how, how would a traditional Tory deal with the Scottish situation and how will Boris Johnson deal with it? Let's just look at it from a Scottish point of view for a little while. I mean, there are so many issues about Scotland leaving its largest customs union. Britain is leaving a customs union. That's going to cause a lot of trouble. If Scotland leaves that customs, its own customs union, its biggest single market, that's going to be very difficult. The issue of the currency, you're familiar, as a great economist, you're, you know about all of these issues. It's not as simple as all of that for Scotland to go independent. And I, 
I must say, as a unionist, I sincerely and from the bottom of my heart hope they won't. Of course, one of the very few things we disagree on. But I'm going to ask you to read in a word. Next election, Boris Johnson wins yes or no, and Scotland independent, yes or no. You first, Peter. Boris Johnson, does he win the next election? No, Boris Johnson will not win the next election. And I hope that Scotland will not go independent. No, it won't. Chris? I think, uh, no, Boris Johnson won't win the next election. And um, probably, yes, Scotland will have gained its independence, or certainly voted for it anyway. Lambert? Boris Johnson will win the next election, whether or not Scotland leaves the United Kingdom. If Scotland doesn't leave, then he has been a successful unionist uh, leader, and I don't see anyone seriously uh, being able to defeat him. But if Scotland does leave, that's 50 fewer opposition politicians to reduce his majority. He can't lose. Well, there we are. We've had it first. In fact, given these last forecasts, someone in the panel is bound to be right. <laughs> so next year, I expect to be playing back at least one of these forecasts, which will look all the more likely to come to pass. This was to be the election which decided the United Kingdom's European future. It has. But has it reopened the question about the future of the United Kingdom? For the first time since 1983, the Tory party has come out of an election having destroyed both of their main Westminster opponents. And unlike Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister Johnson has the bonus of having eliminated his internal opposition at the same time. But in politics, there are always clouds which accompany the silver linings. And there are three storms ahead for Johnson. First, he has promised to get Brexit done not only in the withdrawal agreement by the end of January, but the future trading relationship by this time next year. The first will now be plain sailing. The second looks like mission impossible. Second, few have looked to the Irish results. The losses for the Democratic Unionists mean that for the first time ever, nationalists outnumber unionists in Westminster MPs elected. The SDLP are back in Parliament, having crushed Sinn Féin in Derry. Now, the EU have agreed to admit Northern Ireland into the Union with no formality whatsoever, if that is what is voted for. A United Ireland is now probably closer than at any time over the century since partition. Third, the Johnson arguments against a further Scottish referendum on independence are wafer thin. The SNP, perhaps to their own surprise, ended up with a bigger landslide north of the border than Johnson achieved south of the border. Johnson has been anxious to stress that he will govern as a healing one nation Tory, even if the campaign itself was divisive. Even in his moment of triumph, he may well, in the quiet of the night, fear that he might end up governing but one nation. If so, he'll be remembered not so much as a Winston Churchill, but more as a Lord North, the Prime Minister who lost the American colonies. And it is to that Scottish dimension we will return in the new year, when we ask the SNP whether they have a plan B to answer the inevitable Johnson refusal of an official independence vote. But first, we embark on a mini-series on Finland. This Scandinavian country has just about the best education system in the world and has just appointed the youngest prime minister in Sanna Marin at the age of 34 and has just been designated by the United Nations as the happiest place on the planet. To cap it all, it is the home of Santa. Where could be better for the show to spend the festive period? So until we see you for our Christmas show, it's goodbye from me, Alex, and all of the team, and a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>